Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Shrink Gamer Zidacom video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with Intel and the Cascade Lake X series of processors, which, as the name implies, is a successor to Skylake X. Then we're going to move over to the mainstream with Coffee Lake S and the 300 series motherboards, specifically release dates and other information on various SKUs, including Dual Lake processors. And speaking of Coffee Lake S, a successful mod has been created for a Z170 motherboard. Specifically, this mod has allowed an i3-8350K processor to function in a Z170 motherboard. Naughty, naughty, Intel. And finally, we'll discuss some news concerning the HP NVX360 motherboard and the Ryzen 2500U APU, specifically on the existence of Mobile XFR. But, as I said, first things first, Intel's Cascade Lake X. So, for those who don't know, Skylake X is currently Intel's HEDT platform. That's high-end desktop. This is basically the platform that Intel market towards prosumers, someone perhaps who does a lot of video production, virtual machine work, that type of thing. And the highest end SKU has 18 cores. It's arguable that we probably wouldn't have seen an existence of some of these very high end SKUs without Threadripper, because Threadripper basically give Intel a kick in the pants. It gave them a kick in the pants really bad because I think it's obvious that they did not expect Threadripper to exist. In fact, as we discussed previously in other videos, Threadripper was actually kind of a side project by AMD. They originally had only really been working on Ryzen, uh, for example, the 1800Xs, that type of thing, and of course Epic, and therefore Threadripper had kind of just come together at like the 11th hour, and as it's turned out, it's been a very successful product. So Intel obviously just was not uh, expecting this. And what we have now is Skylink X, which is a very good platform. I still think it's a good platform, but it's very expensive. <clears throat> and I've actually done some reviewing of the um, 1950X. I've done a lot of benchmarks on that. It's why it's taken me so long, because I've not just done like traditional benchmarking. You'll see what I mean when you see the review. But anyway, um, with Skylink X, it is a very good product, especially if you're doing a lot of gaming, because yes, in raw gaming performance, it does slightly pip the Ryzen uh, Threadrippers to the post in terms of frame rate in some games. But Threadripper in terms of a sheer value proposition is incredibly hard to argue with. So fast forward to Q4 2018. That's right, we're looking at about a year into the future and we're going to see the launch of Cascade Lake X. So what is Cascade Lake X? Well, what we do know is it's going to be more of a refresh of the Skylink X node. It's going to be a refined node. It's most likely going to be based on 14nm. Uh, it's going to be either a plus or a plus plus fabrication node. It's not exactly a smorgasbord of information when it comes to the specifications. Most likely Intel themselves are still trying to hammer this information out. So there's a couple of things. It looks like this is still going to be based on X299. So hopefully you're not going to have like a coffee lake situation where Intel arbitrarily just says, No, you are bad, Mr. Kitty. You can't go on this motherboard. Hopefully there will be that cross-compatibility there, which would be great. Most likely, of course, we're going to see new motherboards released, which is fine. I don't have an issue with that, providing users who, for example, are running a 7900X now will be able to put in, I don't know, whatever the process is going to be called. I'm assuming it's going to be like the 8980XE or whatever, you know, from the high end from the next time. Because if you've got a decent platform and all you want to do is, you know, plonk in a new processor, you should be able to do that, at least in theory. I don't know if we're going to have a higher core count. I wouldn't be surprised if Intel tried to bump it up a couple, especially if we have a Threadripper uh, refined, you know, tweaked version, which might uh, end up appearing next year. I wouldn't be surprised. After all, we're having a tweaked version of Ryzen, supposedly. Obviously, we'll have to wait until it's on store shelves at some point, uh, you know, before mid next year. So it's possible Intel might want to contend with that. On the mainstream side of things, specifically Coffee Lake S, uh, there's going to be a couple of new SKUs, SKUs, 
uh, in the first quarter of 2018. Production, at least according to this roadmap, starts on the fifth week of 2018. And there's going to be a new 300 series motherboard selection. Also, uh, production for that is going to be starting on the seventh week. In other words, a couple of weeks after the new SKUs, the CPU SKUs. So, the SKUs will include a dual-core Coffee Lake uh, series of processors for the entry-level segment. I wouldn't be surprised, actually, if those turn out to be okay for gaming, especially if you pair them with a fairly cheap motherboard, assuming they're overclockable. Hopefully, uh, those will contain one K variant, which would be pretty nice. There's also another series of SKUs, uh, which supposedly are going to start... Uh, hitting store shelves around, let's say, April, maybe March, but it's looking like it's going to be more April 2018. Those might be the ninth generation core processors we've discussed, you know, a hundred times now. What we can almost certainly say, however, is it's not going to be a Coffee Lake S successor next year. One small caveat, there's also no mention of the eight core variety of processors which supposedly you know there's so many rumors of this thing actually existing uh for 2018 but there's no confirmation of it here that doesn't actually preclude its existence it just means that intel haven't listed it i wouldn't be surprised if it does exist but i also wouldn't be surprised if it doesn't exist honestly i think if it did exist it's going to be because AMD are pressuring them real bad. I, and I'm not saying these rumours, uh, you know, confirm this or anything, but what I wouldn't be surprised is if we see the, you know, these processors launch at around the same time of, like, you know, the, the improved Ryzen's, and then if the improved Ryzen's happen to clock a little bit better, that's for the sake of argument's sake, say, an extra three, 400 megahertz on top of what we've already got. So let's say they run at around the four point. 3, 4.5 gigahertz mark, let's say 4.4, which I think is quite doable, uh, assuming we see a 12nm variety of uh, Ryzen. We've gone into the details about that before. You can check out that video. I think it's called Ryzen 12nm Analysis or something like that. You can search for that on the channel. Try to remember to link it in the video description. If we get something along those lines, perhaps with a small series of tweaks here or there, Doubtful, but we might see some other tweaks on terms of performance. I don't think we're going to see, like, you know, a totally reimagined um, processor front or back end, or, you know, where they've got uh, new cores or anything like that, or perhaps increased cache sizes. I don't think that's going to going to be a thing. However, if there are a few small efficiency tweaks and, you know, an extra 10, 15% on the core clock, then I do suspect Intel may feel that, okay, what we need to do now is release an 8-core processor. In other words, I wouldn't be surprised if really, as usual, it comes down to Intel. Speaking of Intel, one last tiny titchy into the little thing. Um, there's also going to be Intel's Gemini Lake, which is going to be a system on chip. That's going to be available. It looks basically like it's going to come any day now. Um, and these are going to be a 10-watt quad or dual-core SOC. Once again, probably not exactly going to be the super duper bestest uh, thing for you because, well, you know, if you're a high-end gamer, but hey, it, it is what it is. Now, from one piece of PR from Intel, which sounds kind of cool to something that's not exactly ideal. So, you might be aware that Coffee Lake has currently launched on the 300 series motherboards and there was an there was a uh, some comments from intel to say that the reason behind this is because it wasn't back with the compatible because of power delivery and some other bits and pieces and it was what it was however then a motherboard manufacturer or specifically an individual andrew Wu uh from uh asus accidentally let the cat out of the bag well accidentally on purpose if you prefer that Intel actually made a deliberate, purposeful decision to disable Coffee Lake S support for Z170 and 270. Technically, the motherboards could have could have supported them, but it was like this this decision where it was like there wasn't a specific reason, there wasn't specific figures or anything. It was just Intel just saying, "Hey, yeah, well, we're just going to put up these like you know really wishy washy reasons, and you know no one will really be able to know because you know there won't be any mods or." You know, well, actually, yeah, maybe there will be some mods, because now, fast forward to today, and Ipsy. 
A modder has managed to successfully boot into Windows OS with an i3-8350 on an MSI Z170A X Power Titanium. That is not a short name, is it really? Let's just be honest here. Anyway, and it probably could actually in theory support an 8700K. Now there were some tweaks done here. One of those is a micro, uh, uh, sorry, micro code change, and they also tweaked the BIOS itself. Secondly, they also tweaked the power delivery of the motherboard some. However, it looks like the processor is essentially fully functional, with a few caveats. Uh, the caveat, the biggest caveat, might I add, is that the primary PCIe slot is not working, and the integrated GPU is not working. The integrated GPU, for most people, is going to be like, eh, who cares? The primary PCIe slot could be a bit of a bugger. However, it's possible that this is a motherboard slash driver specific issue, or there are still bugs in the BIOS slash microcode modifications, or whatever. The fact of the matter is, however, this does demonstrate once again that most likely Coffee Lake could have worked on the Z100 slash 200 series boards, but once again, Intel decided just to say, mm, yeah, not so much. Of course, we could hold out hope that Intel decided to comment on this. But I think you'd probably die if you were holding your breath for it. Let's just put it that way. Anywho, on a slightly less morbid note of, you know, dying from asphyxiation, uh, let's discuss the HP MVX360. This information comes to us from techreport.com and specifically deals with mobile XFR. We've gone into details about XFR a half dozen times now, so I'm not going to go over them again. Essentially, it's just the too long didn't read, for those who don't know, is it's basically like Turbo Boost. It just increases the clock speed on a granular basis, dependent upon power, heat, blah, blah, blah. And there were some questions regarding the 2500U, which is inside the NVX360. Um, so there was a 15 to 25 watt TDP, and they were noticing in their reviews that the power consumption was more was higher than what they originally had said it was going to be. And basically, AMD responded, and this is actually a refish, uh, an official line actually from the reviewer's guide, Note, not all notebooks with the AMD Ryzen mobile APU will offer necessary thermal solutions to enable the performance uh, upside of MXFR, that's mobile XFR, but the HP NV X360 featuring the AMD Ryzen processor with Radeon Vega graphics is the first solution to do so. Users looking for an amplified MXFR experience, sorry, MXFR performance in the marketplace should they desire a laptop that offers this capability. So if you want a translation of that, while yes, technically Raven Ridge solutions should be 15 watts, if you are running extended frequency range XFR, mobile XFR, and it feels that a particular workload, the battery state and the temperature conditions are fine and going to allow XFR to start, you know, stretching itself a little bit. It can go up to 25 watts. So this obviously will be great in terms of performance. However, it has one downside. Well, technically two downsides. The first is heat, but the more, you know, accurate one and the one that probably is going to be concerned for more people is going to be the battery life. In other words, it's going to hoover down energy a lot faster. Of course, clock speeds going up and down like a yo-yo is not anything new. Whether we're talking about Turbo Boost 3, which is on, let's say, Pascal, or whether we're seeing um, some other frequency slash uh, state change technology, which has been an Intel processors, ARM processors, AMD processors, it you know exists for a reason, whether it's on the desktop or an extreme mobile device. However, with mobile, it possibly makes even more sense than a desktop. Because yes, with a desktop, ideally, of course, you don't want the clock speeds running at the highest performance because it's going to cost you more in terms of uh, you know your electricity bill and also has slightly more heat output. But of course, ultimately, if the GPU or CPU is not under so much load, it's not going to suck down as much energy anyway. However, 
when it comes to mobile computing, it's even more important because, let's face it, if you have a battery which can last, let's say, three hours, or you can reduce the frequency when you're on, you know, idle, and it can just last, let's say, four or five or six hours, well, obviously, if it's a mobile solution, you're going to much prefer the battery to last as long as possible. Pretty obvious stuff. With all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. Uh, normal stuff. Like, share, subscribe. Check out the Patreon, if you so desire, in the video description. And I shall see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.